Okay, record, John. Great job. Okay, we'll just uh, we'll just get going, folks. Um, so first off, uh, thanks to thanks to Terence for um, taking the time out of his day, out of his evening to answer a few questions um, and share his experience with us. Um, this is now the the ninth um, webinar episode we're doing, um, and as you know, it'll be this is being recorded right now. So if you can make sure your microphone is on mute, your video is on mute as well, and I'll get that recorded on our YouTube channel on Mars Day. Um, just like just like everything, um, if there's a question you want to ask folks, go into the chat feature in Teams, and we'll hopefully get to that at the end. So if there is something you want a bit of clarity on, or you want to ask them parents another question, um, throw away. Okay, so parents, just thanks for your time. We we really appreciate it. We know you're a um, numerous club and county. Um, Representing your, your club and your county, Antrim and Cushion Doll, playing and coaching. And so then we just want to hear your experiences. Um, and if you could share them on, that would be perfect. So we'll just get going, if that's all right. No worries. So we have a number of questions sent in. Um, Terence and I, I've just, we ourselves just put them into, into themes. So the first one is just on your, your personal journey. Can you sort of just describe this um briefly your about your playing your playing and coaching career and how you went from playing into coaching, um Terence? I suppose like every day coach you get involved with your own club. I I started off coaching whenever I was still playing and out there and uh, and out there and just I enjoyed it. Uh my own sons got involved, probably like a lot of parents. You end up coaching teams that they're involved in because you're going to matches anyway and things like that. So that's how I started off coaching, and then uh, Woody Woody became manager when I was still playing. And then when I quit, they asked me to come in, with him. and that's basically how I got involved. And then me and him took over a minor team for Antrim, and that was really my first experience. And but uh, but I've basically every every coach is, I've coached every team in the club. Two or three times over, and then last year I stepped outside my own club for the first time. I went to St Andes, and I'm back now in my own club again. And I've been minor manager, under twenty one manager, random senior manager a couple of times, back and forth. But that's basically it. The same as I'm sure every team out okay. right there. Um, we have we ask everybody on on the on the webinar this. Do you have a um as a coach um your your career and what skill did today? Sorry, Maggie, could you repeat that? I found you broke up there a wee bit. Yeah. Most sorry, sorry, the the, the Wi Fi is not the best. Um, yep, and the as a coach and skills they. Most influential coach I had probably. I take a lot of things from a lot of coaches, bad and good. Like I, I think you can learn as much from uh, perceived as bad coaches or bad managers or, you know, that there. You, you learn a lot going along, but I a lot of good coaches down through the years just took nips, bits from them and different ones all through, like a whole variety from Jim Nelson to Brian Thompson in my own club. And I've watched... Martin Fogarty, Damien Coleman, people like that there, like you're always looking at guys like that, Woody, you know, heaps of guys. Uh, and I take things I like from all of them and try and uh, progress that. Like, you know, but it's you're always learning, you're always you're always trying to get more information and keep going forward, like and keep progressing as a coach. Is there qualities or, or skills that they, they possess that made them stand out to you, Terence? Yeah, for different reasons. Uh, Jim Nelson, for instance, would have, would have been a great uh, forward thinker, a great uh, gel in the team together, giving you belief. Things Brian Thompson, Alec Emerson, and my own club here would have taught me the basics very well. You know, like... The, different things about reputation, things like that there, just from my own club. And then like people like Damien Coleman, I was a friend of uh, Damien's enthusiasm and a feel 
things like that. You know, you you watch people and you learn from them, and you just take bits out of everybody. And Woody, the passion that Woody would give on a training session, like that sort of thing. So as you go along, you learn from other people, and then you, your own personality kind of takes over, and you kind of develop that way. Another you. You know, it's 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 not rocket science, really. Like, I think sometimes we like to complicate it a bit, but really, what you're trying to do is teach people the the skills of the game and to play it in a certain way and that there and like and everybody you get in the field want to be there, so it's not the hardest job in the world to do. Like, perfect, perfect, Terence. We'll just move on to our our next um our next set of questions that is broken into theme of um. So preparations and and um and and team. Um. So the first um, what is the most important skill to you and how and what way do you bring that into a training session by Adriel? Was it first touch? Is it catching? Is it, is it striking? To me, the most important skill in hurling is uh, I suppose I would put it down to ball one and about it getting boys to want a ball because you need to win the ball. No matter what what position the field you are, you have to win the ball. And that comes into reading the game, being aggressive, being technique, the skill of it, not there, different things. And I would play a lot of conditional games, that sort of thing, with emphasis on ball one and ability. Like to me the most important game skill in hurling is ball one. You can be the fastest you want and most skillfully you want, but if you don't have the ball, there's no point in having these assets. You've got to have the ball. And uh, what's the other one there? Is there, yeah, is there, is there a, you sort of touched on it, but is there a drill or a activity or, or some kind of training yeah. you bring in to every, every team you take, whether it's under 14 or whether it be on 21s? Yeah, but the whole drill. Two in the middle, fighting for the ball, going through the gate. I, do you, does every, I would presume everybody would know that. Like a man on each sideline hitting the ball up between two guys in the middle. Then whoever wins the possession has to go through the two cones a meter wide. You're in there for two minutes. The other two come in. You're back out. You're in for another two minutes. Then you build it up, coming to championship, and then just uh, you know three three v five, three v two, or two v three, that sort of thing try to win the ball, hold possession, and then just, you know, different things. Uh, I do different drills there for the forwards coming out, and they've got the, the balls driven into them, and they've ground the man and score. All them different things all brings in the skill and that there, the, your, that comes in your touch. Every, everything I do, 99.9% of it I try to do is game-related as I can. That would be my philosophy, that everything I do from... Other than maybe start off a few striking get drills and that there to get your eye and your touch in, but everything after that would be game related. All uh, tackling, you know, a lot of intense tackling, small set of games, all that sort of thing. All with the emphasis on winning the ball, home possession, the ball, getting the ball back. Like time, uh, I I do a drill there. It's a good drill. Uh, I give the goalkeeper a ball and, and the backs have got inside the 45 metre line. They have to hold possession anywhere inside the 45 metre line and a time how long it takes the forwards to get the ball off the backs. Sometimes I put in an extra forward, sometimes I put in an extra forward just to spice it up a bit and that there. But, and then you time it for a long, it takes the backs to break that down and the forwards tackling. And when the ball comes in, the two backs and forwards, making sure the ball, the ball is at least held up in the forward line that it doesn't come straight back down the field. All them sort of things, Mickey. Class, turns So all, all small set of games and and game scenarios. Good, that's brilliant. Um, the next thing that uh, one sort of always comes up, turns. How do you manage uh, um, varying varying standards um, within a You broke up there a bit, Maggie. Am I right in saying it? Do you want to say how that deal with no, no more. standards? Yeah, yeah. Perfect, that's the one. Uh, that's always a hard one, especially at juvenile level, because, you know, everybody's important and 
uh, again, you and I was the stereotype fat kid that's overweight and wasn't very good when I was very young and out there and out there. So I kind of relate to that, and you know, and you got to make everybody and because especially at juvenile level, you got to try and that there, but you would try and be cute about it, you know, maybe put your two good players together and make sure they go on and then encourage everybody as, as you go in that there. But when you get to county level or senior level at club level, usually there's not, there is a gap obviously in that there, but everybody can usually do the drills or do the sessions and that there, but I would always try and do a thing like, I would maybe organise the thing like, if you're doing in threes or something, you do the half back lane go together, the full back lane go together, half forwards, that sort of thing. Break it up that way and up there, and, and just try and be as cute about as you can. But you, you kind of don't want a guy in the middle of your three top players say and him breaking the drill down every time it does. You just set them out that. But I find the way I do a drill, I make players take control of that themselves. You teach them in a way that they. They pay. I'd always emphasize you pick the best hurler that's going to improve you. You know, the guy that's above you, you think's above you, and you train with him and you you get up to his level. Like if Neil McMahon is, is, is at a, an eight and Aaron Graffin's at a seven, well, Aaron Graffin has to try and get to an eight to get up along with Neil McManus, and they drive each other on that way, and everybody drives each other on whatever level they're at. Does that explain it good enough? Yeah, perfectly, perfectly, Terence. Keeping, making sure your play, your uh, your weaker players are are getting stronger as well as your your stronger players too. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, well, um, it goes the chain's only as strong as the weakest link. Mm-hmm. I like, uh, I always like, I always like that saying. Um, the the what would your standard training station structure look like, Terence, when you're when you're when you're taking a are you sort of but do you, do you do a few uh, scenarios or watch your warm up finish with a game? How long do you give it? That sort of thing. Well, I would start off usually, like, obviously, the, the, they'll do the warm up they do for every game. The warm up is reputation, reputation. It's just getting used to it so that no big deal. And the players usually would get into a routine after a while and doing that themselves and let one person take it out there. But I would start off with with a target of hitting about 70 to 100 balls between uh, start off opening the shoulders up, getting the legs in, long distance striking on the move, then maybe two opposite, two, 21 to 21, moving, driving the balls at each other, then closing it in, 21 to 45, then even closer, then falling the ball. So before you start to hurl, you've, you've struck about somewhere between 70 and 100 balls at match pace. Everything has to be done, attacking the ball, on the move, no planting the feet, doing away with all the bad habits, making sure you're, in, and you're on top of people at that time that there is no bad habits. Nobody plants the feet, had a ball, left and right, both sides, short and stick when need be, things like that, you're driving that on at a high pace. Then you would go into a couple of tackling drills and then you would go into match game related small set of games and then you might end up if you're doing any tactics the way you're going to play a bit of shooting that there then you're going to finish off maybe be that time 10 15 minute game at the end with conditions in it where you can only hold the ball for two seconds maybe if you want to do that or you, the ball has to go through the lines or whatever whatever you're working on at that but with that particular team at that particular time. It varies from time of the year to sessions, what way we're playing, who we're playing, you know, that sort of thing, Maggie, to be honest. Is that explain it okay? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And even just on the, the warm-up turn, so that's, Jesus, if you were saying the team, you're going to strike 70, 100 balls here at the start, like that's something players want at the same time as well. You know, you're not getting too bogged down with, with, with run or stretches. At the same time, well, Mickey, I would use that to get people into the right frame of mind, because I find if 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 you take the first fifteen ten minutes to get people up to the the pace of training, you know, because and I find if if you went into a game straight off, then people are standing about, they're only hitting the winner balls. 
everybody's going into that game now. They should the heart rate should be up, the lungs should be well pumped up, the legs motivated, moving, and you're weeding out the guys in that drill that are had a row with a girlfriend or something out there. They're in bad form. They are now in a zone where they know that you're not accepting mediocre. Every ball matters. Every ball matters. So when you go to do the next drills, which are the ways, the ones you want to work on, the team situation, everybody's tuned in. I would use that 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes maybe, all depending, to get people's mind tuned in as well. That would be an important aspect for me. 100%. 100%. Can, sounds brilliant, Terence. Class, first class. Um, the the next thing, just the last point in this, this slide, um, is what, what is your process? What does your process look like, especially with things coming up, hopefully sooner or later, with the isolation? 10 days for a championship game. What, is it, what does it look like um, for you? What are you focused on? What are you, what are you getting boys ready to do? It's it's all about head work then. It's all about your head. You're not going to get anybody fitter in ten days, or you you, you can't improve, but you can ruin it. I, I always think that like you want people to get in fresh for the game. I would cut down the games like rather than maybe start a year you're playing half an hour games at the end or something like that. There you cut them down to ten minutes. You want people to get in hungry for hurling, hungry for the ball. You're doing all your head work then. You're you're targeting your individual players that you want to get arm around the shoulder. You're the other guys getting a kick in the ass. You're you're pushing the buttons when people that need to be pushed. But you're really going into that game fresh and ready to go mentally and that there and like your team talks and all is done. Like uh, the day of a game, I I don't say a way lot, do a way lot. I, as a player, I used to have managed to come in and went through the whole team. And if you were left half back, you weren't interested what was coming before Audrey, what was said to you, and then your mind went somewhere else. So I don't think players really tune in. They're all in their own zone. And it's just, to me, it's all about getting that you you can't guarantee when you cross the white line what's going to happen. But the one thing you can guarantee is you're going to be in a shift. And that's really what I focus on. We don't know. And I would visualisation a lot of things that like I would on the Tuesday nights before the something would talk, there's going to be a band parade. We might be late to the game. There might be a traffic hold up. You won't, something's going to happen. They make the band might come out. It might be raining. It might be what there. Go through all the scenarios that you can and picture it. Nothing affects us. We focus on the game when the whistle goes. And the only thing you can guarantee when you cross the white line, you bring your desire, your passion to it. That's the only thing you can guarantee. We've all played games, Mickey, where it's passed us by. Other days, the ball just doesn't bounce for you and there's nothing you can do about it. But you can guarantee, no matter what happens, you, the only thing you can guarantee, you're putting in a shift and you can control the controllables. You can control whatever you can. And don't worry about the things you can't control. Uh, basically, is that okay? Is that uh, brilliant. 100%, oh, geez, 100%. That's, that's great. Great, great answer. Honest to God. Thank you, Terence. Um, the next thing is this is more focused just on game day and you've touched on some things already. Um, one of the questions sent in was some people say come match day, you know, the, the, the coach manager has done all, all they can do um, and until they can do no more. Do you believe that's true? And if not, what do you feel is your role, uh, the role of the coach or manager on game day? Smiggy, it varies game to game. To say one thing, there's some days you do things that really work, and other days you do things that are like, like my run with St. Enders there. I used three subs one day, we won by a point, and they won as a match. They turned the game. The very next day, I brought the three subs on the same three teams, and the, it was a disaster. I could have took them right off again. So there's times you do these things that work, and times you don't, but as far as motivating players, it's very limited. You just you just make sure people are not scared of it, that they're looking forward to it, and you get the overalls on, and you go out to work, and you do your job, and everybody's got clarity what they're doing, crossing the line. Once they cross the line, hurling such a game of variables, conditions, people you're marking, people you're playing. You could be marking a big guy for the first 20 minutes, and he's all over you, driving you into the ground. Five minutes later, you're on a wee small flying machine. 
the players, you've got to teach players how to deal with all them sort of things and teach them. So 90% 90, 90 of your work's done long before you get to the game, really. But there is things on a day you can you do that work and there's other days it doesn't make it. It's just, you know, like nobody puts a sub on ever thinking that they're not going to be any use. That's never happened. But we all know there's many a time a sub went on that you could took them right back off again. But that's just that's just the nature of the beast and the nature of the thing. And you try and read the game as best you can. I wouldn't get too involved in games. I'm not a roaring and shouting sort of guy. That people find that hard to believe. If you ever seen me in a training session, I'm a different animal from there to the day of the game. Like Philly Curran said to me, like we went in seven points down against in the Ulster final. And and he said he he couldn't believe he thought we're in for some ballack in here and I and he said to me after I couldn't believe you were the calmest man in there you hardly said a word he said just boys if we keep doing what we doing we're going to win this game and and that's all you can do at times like nobody goes out to do things bad and if you see fifteen guys in a field and they're trying their hard out you just got to let it go and it'll develop itself like you can't I don't I. I always believe maybe managers get too much credit and too much blame. Really, it's all about the players. If you get the players right and teach them to make the right decisions and you have good leaders among that group, well, there's not a lot more you can do, really. And would you have any would you have any root would you have any routines that you'd sort of try and get the, the, the team to do before a before a game? Um Terrence, like would you do the warm up come back in the change rooms or, or go out straight or what? Just wee things like that. A game, Mickey, it all depends on the, the venue. Like, if there's a venue we, you know yourself, some venues go to, you can't go down to 15 minutes before the game or whatever. Or if you go to like an own bag, you can go down to the back pitch or somewhere like that. But if you had him going to a casement, there was nowhere uh, the time you'd get another club and down through the crowd and out there. It all varies, but I, I purposely try and keep it. As simple and as same as we always did as possible. It's just another game, but up the emphasis of the pressure, you know, and embrace the, the occasion, enjoy the occasion. Everybody, everybody, nobody takes up hurling to play in muck and gutters in the middle of the winter. We all take up hurling to play in Crow Park on nice sunny afternoons, you know, that's what it's all about. And, but there's days you got to just adapt, and it's all adapting, but like it's, it's, Getting your team that something's going to throw up, the other team's going to score a goal. We're going to get fouls against us. There, every team's going to score. What happens when that happens? What do you do? And and whenever it happens, it doesn't become a shock. Like we could be lit for the traffic, we could be held up, the bus could break down. Who knows? But nothing changes your focus. Just focus, focus on your own job, and make sure every player has clarity. I keep saying that when they get on the field, they know the job that they have to do. And you you focus on that. That's your job. It's like if you take a guy to paint your bedroom and he doesn't do it, you can say you didn't do it. You know that was your job on the day. You do it. You know and clear the gap. But I try and keep it. I don't do any big meetings the night before. I try and change it around. I keep it because I find that puts more pressure on player. You just after the Thursday night or the Friday night, whenever you call up, that's really it. Meet for the game. I'm not a great fan of meeting on a Sunday morning to go for breakfast before the game all this year. Just do what you do normally. Keep it as keep it as normal as you possibly can. That would be my advice anyway. No, I really, really, I really like that. Like that's some, like just the simplicity there, two turns and control, control what you can, control the controllables is what what, what you're saying. Um, the the next question is just it's. it's Someone used the mentality that you know they run through a run through a wall for you. Now you, you'd probably hear that a lot with um, different managers that they do an inning, inning, inning for that for that person. How, how do you how do you build that into a team? Like, is that, you know, I would always believe that you, any the best managers I played for, you know, I had the utmost respect for them. And if they said run through a wall, I'd run through a wall. I might bounce off the wall, but I'd I'd, I'd try it anyway. Yeah, well, I put the, what I tend to do is uh, like. Uh, Certain guys you push buttons when not there, and there's everybody's different. If I use like uh, like an iron graph and so motivated or somebody like that, there you're pushing his buttons. You know you're saying, you no, know, like uh, 
people are saying you're nearly done, like you're finished, blah, blah. Where if Paddy McGill, you put your arm around him, Paddy, I think you're one of the best forwards in Ireland, blah, blah. You know, everybody's different how you how you switch them on, how you motivate them. But like to me, you give them a dream. It becomes their dream. When you start off the year, you, you, I'm a great believer in visualization. Picture another so you, you give them a dream of what, what they want to achieve, you know, where it's one in a county title or one in a league or whatever it is, give them a dream. This is your dream. You take control of your own career. This is your career. I'm just here to facilitate a training session. This is not my career. My career is over. You're gone. You have to take charge of your dream. And you dream, and then, um, and the guy beside you, like, you make sure he doesn't let you down. Like, everybody's in this together because you know yourself, like, if you're wing half or if you're a corner back and the wing half is in one of his moods and doesn't want to put in the effort, your, your day just became a lot harder. You know, so everybody has to be in it together. Like, you kind of, some dipping in, some dipping out. So you give everybody a, a dream and everybody, like, Leaders make leaders. Like everybody has to become a leader. This term leadership thrown out, and everybody thinks of the Roy Keane or the Michael Jordan or something like that there. But really, everybody, the ideal team, everybody leads. Everybody becomes this leader, and good leaders create more leaders. And that would be my mentality of why people would say they get through a wall. They're not going through a wall for me when they say that. They're going through a wall for their dream. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? No, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So more like player, push the team, and given that, is that is that what you're sort of talking? Sorry, Mickey, what was that? P- more, more to do like player ownership. Um. Yeah, I'm a great believer, Mickey. It's all about the players. It is. Like, <laughs> whenever people say that, I go through a wall for the manager. It's, they're not really saying I go through a wall for my. They're going through in a wall for what the manager has created, you know, that to get to their goal. If you set a goal to win a county title or win an all earn, I would go through a wall to win that all earn. That's what really you're saying. And that's your goal. And you and you set a goal and that's your target, you know, and all you're doing is facilitating that dream for them. You're creating that dream and helping them to achieve their goals, their dreams, what they want. But you have to kind of manipulate them into giving them a dream mm-hmm. and that thing and they take ownership of their own team of their own teammates and they create the environment where mediocre doesn't live like mediocre is cancer to any G8 or any team in the world any sport mediocre is, is shouldn't be allowed where it's doing a first touch drill or playing a county final it's the same thing every ball matters I really, I really love, I love that perfectly explained parents. Thank you. I really, I really, really like that. Hey, I definitely try and bring that in my own, my own game as well. That's Maybe, class. Maggie, I'm making a job Walter. Council shortly. Hey, if I you want, a, if, if you want a recommendation. Want <laughs> a recommendation? Want a recommendation? I was done to you. Um, just the last one. This here, Terence. Um, just on on my match day, what, what percentage would you would you um would you give to to studying your opponents and where them strengths or weaknesses, or are you all about your own team and where what you can do as your as your own team? Well, again, Mickey, there, like you would do a wee bit, but not much. Like I say, you control what you can control. I can't control what the lawyer or Lucky or St John's or. Kenny or anybody else does. I can only control what we do. So you worry about that. But obviously, you maybe set up scenarios that to counteract the other team's strengths. You look at the other team. Obviously, you do. You look and see where they're danger. And maybe, like, I wouldn't be changing my whole team around to suit another team. But I would definitely look upon it that, like, if they've got a style of play, let's counteract their style of play. Let's let's not let them play the game they want to play. I would look at that, you know, like if somebody wants to play with a sweeper or not there, like I'll decide who's who's their sweeper, do you know what I mean? Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't let them play. You try and, you, you try and force 
that you don't allow them to play their, their style of game, you know, as much as you possibly can. Some days it's easier than others, and some days you just can't, you know, it all depends on the opposition and that there, like, you know, and maybe some days you have to play with a sweeper and some days you don't, and some days you play with three midfielders and don't, and some days you put a, a target man at the edge of the square because you think you can get change out of that or hammer the hammer, as they talk about, or whatever. But it's, I don't get too much into it, Mickey, because sometimes you can you can overthink it and because every game's different. You go and you watch a team play and you think, oh, God, their cornerback's really weak. Like, our semi-final against, uh, against uh, the Galway team, the last Galway team we played in Parnell Park, we targeted, uh, well, the management targeted their cornerback was kind of their weakest to the backs, and we allowed him to go free. He ended up scoring the one on point to beat us. You know, so, you know, so you know, these things every day is different. You go and watch a player one day, and you think, oh, he's something else, and you know, maybe he wasn't that good, and you get too hyped up about. No, the answer is, Maggie, basically, I wouldn't get too hung up on the other team. I would focus a lot on my own, but I would definitely dig in into account what the other team's threats are or their weaknesses is. I would look at their weakness, try and target their weaknesses and try and counteract their strengths as much as possible without upsetting my own team. Mm-hmm. Perfect. 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 Yeah, 100%. 100%. 100 And thanks. The examples are brilliant too. Thank you for the, just... You know, talking through the what what, what you've learned through your, your coaching career. Um, I, we're we're more into we're more into yourself here now. Um, as many more of your your playing career now, Terence. Um, and you're probably sick of a few of these that we'll ask them anyway. Um, Terence, who who's the best player you've you've played with, with and the best player you you see you've coached? Because I've played with, uh, in Ulster terms, I've played with some great players like. I was blessed to play in a good Cushing Doll team and a good Antrim team. Uh, you know, and even in Ulster teams, like I played along with Noel Keith, Paddy Braniff, Danny Hughes, Noel Sands, Marty Malm, Gaza, all them people from down, and then Derry, Kieran McKeever, the Downies, you know, Ollie Collins, people like that. They're all great players. Another, but probably Sunday in, Sunday out, as good a player, I would have to say, and I would use the term as, Leonard McKeegan and James McNaught in my own club. Because I, I played along with them every Sunday right up through you know, and for the county as well. So it'd be hard to go by them. But you know, you're talking Brian Donnelly's, Aidan McCarry's, Woody's, Gary O'Kane's, you know, like Clint McFedrick's, you know, need to say more, Desi Donnelly, you know, Humpy, you know, the list could go on. But if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick. For longevity and commitment to the county and club, James probably, James McNaughton. And and would you would you have a player you say um, best player you've 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 coached? Would you have one or probably probably too too tough? But do you have one? No, I wouldn't have won the stands out. It'd be unfair because I'm still coaching the minute. Like obviously, mm-hmm. people would expect me to say Graf and Neil McManus, people like that. There, Paul Shields from Deloy. It was a dream to coach people like that. Big Happy, Big Happy was a at Hammond Manor was like what a loss he was to Antrim, like things like that, you know. But it's hard. I wouldn't like to say that, Megan, because the, there's so many from other clubs and my own club and that there and that there. And there's some great kids among them, like and some great people have made some lifelong friends out of it all, like and like what is a good player to coach? A guy that would run through a wall for you, as we talk about, or a guy mm-hmm. very talented. Like some of the best players I coached wouldn't be the most skillful, like, but they were so easy to coach and they would do anything for you. Like even up in St. Enders there last year, Philly Curran, 37 years of age, like if I had told Philly to climb the post, he'd have run up at like a 37 years of age. <laughs> you know, so. Uh. The class, Terence, class. I know it's a, it's, a, it's a team sport too, but the, the question was asked, I'm just going to, the question was put in, so I'll just, I'll just ask it. But anyway, um, 
Karen, do you have a favorite game that you've been involved with over over your um over your career? Ah, she's Mickey. Lots of games. Obviously, the one probably got you to the All Ireland final. Like that was the ultimate goal, and we didn't do ourselves justice. Was the awfully game eighty nine that would stand out. But a lot of club games. Like I, I played at sixteen years of age, and our club's first ever county title. And I kind of took it for granted, you know, that that's what it was, that, you know, and that there, but 99, Deloy beating us with seven points, with about seven minutes to go, coming back, beating them, things like that. There was some great occasions down through the years, like, you know, but I'd have to say, probably the one most important would have been the Anthem one, like, I played in a, a heap of semi-finals, all earned semi-finals between county and club, and only ever won one, and that was a one-on-one, so I'd probably say that, the awfully game 89. And that uh, the next question is sort of similar, but the you know a, b- a biggest achievement you like you have eight Anthem titles, seven All Stars, you have an All Star, you know the game in the '89. Do you have a, a you know your a favorite a favorite achievement or a biggest achievement, um, Terence? No, maybe, to be honest, I don't because here's how it is: like, like I believe there's people with pocket full of all, all earned medals that weren't as good a hurler as me. And I believe that there's guys that are better hurler than me that never won an All-Star. And them awards come, I don't vote for them. And I know if I've gone away like the Hall of Fame and things like that and voted All-Star hurler, the sense and all these things. But they're all good. They're nice to get in the person. And the All-Star will put you into a little club. But no, I don't like it. To me, the greatest success I've had is playing the game at the highest level for as long as I did. I, I just love the game of hurling. Like, like, like people forget about it. It's all about the game, Mickey. Like, don't ever lose that sight. It's all about the game. The game is more important than any awards or any All Ireland. And I said there lately in a podcast, I played for 23 years, and every year ended in failure. If you want to look at it like that, you know, like even when you won the All Star, you won your county title, then you could beat an All Ireland semi final. That year ended in failure. Antrim ended in failure. To play for 23 years and every one of them, uh, people will look at if you're talking about awards ended in failure. And I don't feel a failure. I feel a very, I, I had a great career and I was blessed to play along with some great fellas and hurl against some of the, the greatest names ever to play in the game the DJs, the Coonies, the English, all these sort of people. I was blessed to play at that level for as long as I did. And to me, that's success, Mickey. That's my success. I, I played the game I love. For as long as I possibly could, and um, if God had to give me a win more legs or something, I would have played for another ten years. Class, class, Terence. We're just, we're just, we're right in, we're in the last slide here now, um, and it's just sort of, we like to, like a sort of last impression for everybody. The feeling is going to go away with. Um, do, do you have a, do you have a favourite resource or anything, um, um Terence, or, or where you get your, you know, ideas for for trends or, or match related stuff like the having or do you or what's your thoughts on that? I just watch other people training and I pick up ideas here and there and I, I read books. I'm a sports fanatic. Uh, well, not a sports fanatic. I like what I read and I I do the audible books, Mickey. You know, and I walk around the beach and around the cliff path. Ninety nine nights out of a hundred, like and not there, and I've got headphones on and somebody's reading me a book and just chill out with the dog and things like that or you know nothing to say. like I believe in keeping it simple my game like hurling's a game if you can master the basics you can nearly do anything if you know what I mean if you can want a ball when eight times out of ten and if you can pick a ball when you want to and strike it where you want to and score like you will make but if you can do the basics in hurling and you keep yourself in good enough neck and your head's right like it's all like I think we're getting too much away from like we were like the game of hurling was producing great hurlers when there was no none of this no and I'm not saying I'm a dinosaur because this all this helps to extent but it's it, nothing will take away from the skills of the game and the desire for the game like desire has won more matches than tactics ever will. Does that make sense? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, I like that. Okay, class, class, Terrence. Um, couldn't do that, man. Um, 
the, the second last second last question is what what's the best I suppose lesson you've learned from from coaching, you know, from when you from coaching? What's the best I've learned? Yeah, um from from, from the start out coaching to now. It's don't take yourself too serious. It's all about the players. Like it's like you can you can drive the bus, but the players is the engine. You know what I mean? You're only steering it. Just believe in your players and enjoy it. Mate. Like the reason that the reason you go out there and you stand in the rain or in the summer's evening or whatever it is is because you love the game. It's all about the game, and I keep referring that to everybody I talk to. It's like when you're standing along the line and you're arguing with a referee or you're arguing with a whoever or you're you're getting mad or you're you're getting excited and happy, at least you know you're alive. When you're lying on a sofa watching East Enders, so you might as well pull the pen and see what's next. Is that all right? Brilliant. And I think even if you nearly clearly every slide is, you know, don't do things too too serious it's about about the player like that's very very clear it's about the players at the end of the day and you've said that in every slide and our, just our last thing Terence um, before we see if there's any questions sent in but um, what, what would be your top three pieces of advice for any, any club coach whether you're Camogie Hurling Ladies fo- Football Men's Football what what would the top three pieces of advice would be well the first thing I tell like uh, uh I've 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 some good sayings that I use that I, that I try and lead my life by, and one is if you've got a problem, look in the mirror before you look out the window, because the problem could lie with you. If you're not getting in the team or you're not fit enough or you think you're not that there, don't start looking for excuses to blame other people. Look in the mirror. The problem, the problem, nine point nine times out of ten lies with you. The other one probably. Just be the best you can be. Like success for some teams, like su- success for say Slot Neil, if they don't win Ulster, it's a failure. For Lauren Hurling Club, if they don't get 15 fellas on a field and and fulfill their fixtures, that's success for them. Be the best you can be, whatever level at you're at, and enjoy it. Not everybody's going to be Messi or Michael Jordan or a TJ Reid, you know. Enjoy it because life's too short and enjoy the game and just be the best that you can be. Sometimes if a guy should get an A star and he gets an A, it's a failure. But if a guy should get a a B and he gets a you know and he gets an A, that's success. You know, everybody's different and everybody's different. But in, enjoy the journey, Mickey. Sometimes the destination can be a bit of an ugly climax. It's all about the journey, how you get there, I think. And enjoy the crack. Is that all right? Class, Terence. Uh, I swear to God, could listen to you, could listen to you all day, hey, class, Terence. Um, I'm just going to click in here to see if we've any, um, any questions sent in, um, Terence, if that's all right. Um, we've got two here now, actually. Um, uh, Colin Duffy says, "In does Sambo feel that it's worthwhile for the GA to have any inter-county action this year, or should solely focus on clubs?" Uh, I, th- I, I think to it's call, I, th- I, everybody wants to play at the highest level they possibly can, and I think the county fellows want to do that too, but. An all Ireland on Boxing Day could be strange, funny. I'm looking forward to it to see what it's like and that there. But I do think the GA was right putting the clubs first because that means everybody gets to play. Like, you couldn't have the clubs going first and the clubs having to wait about for another two months, say, that county's finished. That would have been unfair. I back the GA. I think they've, what they've done is right. I think if the clubs get a few league games and a couple of championship games and Maybe end up with nine, ten games and a couple of friendlies maybe throughout the year. That would be as good as we could expect it because two months ago would have been took one game if you know what I mean. You know, so let's be thankful for what we have and 
I think the county needs to go ahead too for a whole lot of reasons for revenue and everything like that. People use revenue if it's a bad word. The Crow Park needs to survive. It needs money to survive. And I understand that there. But if the clubs are finished and the most counties now can for sale a floodlight facilities where they can play county games on a Friday night or something like that there under floodlights. So like where clubs you couldn't you couldn't play clubs during the winter because not every club's got floodlight facilities to play at night and things like that and it gets dark in the evening so they couldn't train so it's right that the counties go next because they have got the facilities and the, the power to be to go and use floodlights where most clubs wouldn't have that facility and I, I believe that you've done right alright 100%, 100%, and like, as you said, you just go away with it, with it, took your arm off for, for one or two games, never mind, you know, a, 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 a championship format, and even, you know, socially too, more than, more than, more than a lot of things, like people need to, even for their, for their mental health, and, yeah, you know, there's the big word, the game, like, it all I even know, around my own club at the minute, for young guys, mental health, and that there, like, and, uh, they need to get out in the field shortly. Like, I see the kids outside my own front door and out there. They need to get playing hurling or doing something because there's nothing else in all these rural parishes around the country. Only GA. Like, what else is in Cushendall? Only hurling. Like, we don't play soccer. We can't do anything. And you see them running around there now in groups and they're dying to get at it and they need to get at it. And so does everybody, to be fair. Well, under license laws, if, if everybody's safe, obviously the paramount is player safety. Nobody's throwing the baby out of the water. Like We have to be sensible about it too, but if we are able to do it, let's do it. 100, 100%. And like, God, there's only so long we can do these virtual things for yeah. and, and, and doing these runs. There's nothing beats it. <laughs> um, Liam, Liam sent a, 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 um, a question there. Um, who, was your, who was your toughest player you played against, um, Terence? <sighs> That, believe it or not, <laughs> one of the lessons I learned a long, long time ago. Remember Mark and Joe Cooney in a railway cup game, and getting having a real good game against them. You no know, one of them pats in the back when you walk off the field, sort of game. That was some performance you put in there. That's the best for it in Ireland, all that sort of talk. And two nights later, a guy scored two, three off me that he couldn't even get in his club team. So. My lesson there was respect everybody and fear nobody. You know, but like Aidan Ronan gave me a wild roast from one day. But that was but there was days people just the bounce the ball went for him and you had an off day and not there. Maggie, that's that's impossible because you could get the better of a guy one day, like Aidan McCarry, you could go out and get the better of Aidan McCarry one day and the next day clean you out. The same with Brian Donnelly or Clint or people like that there. Like good hurlers. It's it's hard for you to dominate a good hurler if you're playing him, marking him every night at training, or maybe in club games three or four times a year. Like good hurlers will have to get one over on each other at some stage. Not just the nature of the beast. So to me, it's I've got roastings and many of them, but more often than not, it was to do with my own lack of attitude at times. Like some games, you know, it was hard for me to get up for the tournament in January, sort of thing, and. That there, you know, I always enjoyed the the bigger the name, the bigger the occasion, the more I liked it sort of time. You know, mm -hmm. does that explain anything? Yeah, great, great, great. Liam just says that he's but we we'll see Casey reopen in the near future. I suppose like, like all of us, Jesus, we hope so. Like I was last there myself one one or two years, like in oh, at some at some venue, but. It's out of our hands, the one of the guess. Yeah. And then, go on ahead, sorry. No, no. What was the question? Sorry. No, I just said, well, we see casement in the near future um, open, but we, we don't really. Ah, here, Maggie Antrim needs a home. That's a sin. I feel strongly about that. I think Antrim need a home, and they need to get casement up and going, or... It's, it, it has to come to an end somewhere. Like, this is good. There's a whole generation never going to play in Casement. 
And I go back to my days of them great Ulster finals with Derry and Down and that. You know, and maybe 15 to 20,000 of them. Like, like there's, there's a real love for Ulster hurling out there. You know, and, and I would love to see it back again. And hopefully, whenever things get over and things we can settle down, let's dig a sod there and get it going. 100%. Hey. As soon as... As soon as this, this virus and things get back to normality, you know, it'll be good to hopefully put that in the priority, priority list. Like a brilliant, a brilliant, brilliant venue, hey, brilliant venue. Oh, my um, favorite. And that's that's that's. Wouldn't you wouldn't say you wouldn't say Owen Big or 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 Sally Park now? I was told. No, no, I'm a case with man. Born and <laughs> around, you know, many many a lovely summer's evening training with from down through the years and good county finals in it and minors and. Coaching teams in it and different things and, and some bad days in it too, great right enough. But I loved Casement. The the pitch in Casement was something special. Um, Terence, that's 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 really us for the night. Now, John, John um, Denovi says, "Tell us a bit about your." I don't really know John. Maybe you know John well. Um, John Devote Novi. Um, uh, Terence just says. Yeah, we'll leave it there, and you can chat if you want them, John. Um, but I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it an end here now, folks. If, if everybody's um.